Okay, taking a look at engine main bearings. The first thing we're going to do is uh, identify the type of bearing that's being used in this engine. And the next thing we're going to do is take a look at it physically, how we do the measurement process and to find out if it falls within manufacturer specifications for permissible end float or end play in the crankshaft. Typically the crankshaft end thrust causes the crankshaft to move back on the helical cut gears on the crankshaft and the cam gear itself or any adjacent gears in the front gear train of the engine. So what we need to do is make sure that we have that particular running clearance in there so that we're not um, going to cause any scuffing, scoring or abrasions in the end float of the crankshaft. It's also important that if we have excessive crankshaft end play, what happens is the, every time the clutch is pushed or engaged in the vehicle that the crank moves ahead and then walks back under natural movement of the helical cut gears on the gear train. So that causes excessive movement of the piston and the reciprocating assembly in the cylinder which causes premature wear and usually will cause an out of round condition. So taking a look at engine main bearings, and I'll, I'll talk about these ones more in a little bit of detail in just a moment. We have a split shell bearing that here has thrust flange surfaces on it. These flanges on either side of the crank itself help control the end float of the crankshaft fore and aft in the movement as it's moving in the engine while it's operating. So if we take a look at these two particular bearings, they're completely different than the one that does not have the side on it. Normally this is the style of bearing that we see coming out of connecting rods and also standard main, or main bearings but not main thrust. If we take a look at the caterpillar bearing, these bearings happen to be a U set and we can see a couple different character differences here. One we have oil holes in this one and only one in this one. This is a plain type bearing. They're both plain type friction bearings, but this one actually has an extra area for an increased amount of volume of lubrication. In the event that the engine oil pump, pressure regulating valve, or pressure relief valve cannot compensate for a changing engine RPM or even cavitation from the bottom end from the pickup of the engine oil pump. So this allows an extra volume of oil here so that if we do have an extra load on it, we have sufficient volume of oil. A lot of manufacturers have gone to this style as opposed to a plain style that does not have that extra groove. The manufacturer of this particular bearing too, Caterpillar, what they've done here is they have allowed this bearing to run in different configurations. So one in the saddle and one in the cap. And it's taken the guesswork out of the correct position because we have multiple holes which can be used for multiple engine designs. So this prevents the manufacturer from having to actually create a brand new bearing for various styles of engines. So one other thing that we take a look at on these bearings is the tang. And in previ previous videos I've indicated that the tang is only for the purpose of installation of the bearing. It does not hold it there. What holds it there is the crush and when it's crushed into position with the cap torqued on either the main cap or the connecting rod cap, then it holds radial pressure all the way around on both bearings to keep it in its respective position. In previous videos to show you the proper procedure for checking the running clearance, which we call VOC, which is vertical oil clearance. We have to have the right amount of oil there to help lift and support that rotating component. If we have the right amount there, it provides lots of longevity to wear from the minimum spec up to the maximum spec. So if we take a look at the next thing on the bearing is identifying the bearing through a part number. So to bring the numbers to light here, I'm just going to use some chalk and go over top of the numbers and then wipe off the excess. Now we can closely look at the bearing, identifying numbers to determine what bearing we need to put back into the engine. So if we take a look at this split shell bearing now with thrust flanges on it, so this is our main thrust bearing, and I've used the chalk to bring the numbers to light so I can see the actual manufacturer part number here. It tells me the position of this bearing, which is the upper bearing shell.
And it also tells me that it's a 112 STD. And STD stands for on this bearing standard, which indicates that it's a standard dimension bearing to get the running clearance established by the manufacturing process of the crankshaft, the bore, as well as the bearings when it's all pos positioned and installed into the engine. Right. Okay, taking a look at the next bearing that I have here for identification is that we don't see the STD labeling on here. We have a smaller number which indicates a aftermarket or a different configuration of application of this particular bearing. It's also telling us here, and I've used the two bearings for the instruction purpose, that one was an upper and this one is a lower. So it takes the guesswork out of installation procedures of the bearing. We can always look at it and identify it's a lower, and we can always look at it and identify it if it's an upper. The important factor right here is this value. And you can see, and it's kind of hard to see, but I've used the chalk to bring it to light, that we have 0 .010, which is 10 thou. So when we see the indication of 10 thou, that tells us that we have a 10 thou undersized bearing. So that means the crank journal is smaller than OEM. And I'll explain that uh, as we continue through the video. Continuing on, taking a look at a different style of bearing again, is we have a split shell bearing, the upper and the lower, two different applications like I gave previous instruction on, but we also have something here that this manufacturer has used to control the end float. On the other bearings, we have a thrust flange on the bearing, and it's part of the split shell. This one is just a split shell, and then we actually use a brass shim that slides down into the block, sits into position, and between two of them, controls the end float. So we would have one on one side, one on the other, and the manufacturer is prescribed based on the size and dimension of these shims, how much end play it's going to control. Okay, taking a look at the crankshaft and understanding uh, the vertical oil clearance and how the effect of a undersized crankshaft affects the bearing that needs to be installed, we'll take a look at now. So we have our crankshaft here, and we have our bearing bore, and we have our bearing which is indicated in blue. So the running clearance would be right in here. And this running clearance is known as our vertical oil clearance, which is going to establish how much oil we can actually get into that area to help lift and support that component. Now, the bearing, again, in this particular case, would be indicated as an STD bearing or a standard dimension. S so this bearing has a certain amount of girth to it to help support the load uh, and the running clearance that we need for this crankshaft. When the crankshaft is machined down, we're actually going to go undersize. And when we go undersize, we're going below the original OEM dimension of the crank. So now if we machine it, we're actually going smaller than or creating an undersized journal. Where technicians misunderstand is if the crank becomes worn, we need to put a bigger bearing in there. So if we take a look at this next diagram, so if we tend to go less than OEM specification on the crank size, so we've actually gone to what's called a US or an undersized dimension, that means that that crank journal is smaller than OEM. And when it's smaller than, we need to have a bearing that's larger to help bring back the running clearance. As in the prior diagram, we have a running clearance in here indicated in black, and that's the clearance that we have between the bearing and the journal surface installed. That gives us our VOC again. You can see dimensionally on this diagram, we have more girth here. The girth takes up material to bring the bearing face closer to establish the VOC. So now what we're doing is we're using an undersized dimension bearing to support a larger clearance when the bearing is installed. The problem is, is right here. The thickness of this bearing 
right in here, is now greater than OEM, which means we have more material there. Now the problem happens during running operation is we have more cushion now for that bearing to be squeezed on. And when we do impact loading in a condition such as a rod bearing application with an undersized bearing, we could potentially squeeze that bearing and it's actually known as a condition where we get bearing squeeze where it crushes the bearing down from impact loading and eventually creates way too much vertical oil clearance. When that happens, then we don't have the correct running clearance and our engine oil pressure drops because the void now becomes bigger, decreasing the size of the cavity, increasing, or pardon me, decreasing the amount of pressure and volume available to the bearing. 